the makers of Ex-Lax present Strange As It Seems. Tonight, our search for the strange and fantastic things that happen in this world takes us across the seas and the years to old England, where a strange thing happened in Tewan Churchyard, just outside London. And then we go all the way to the South Pole for another strange occurrence. But before we take you on this long journey, we want to speak of a very familiar thing you find as close to home as your medicine chest or your corner drugstore. Meaning, of course, x lax There is nothing strange about the fact that more x lax is bought than any other laxative in the world. It is logical that it should be, because it is milder, gentler, thoroughly effective, and more pleasant to take since it tastes just like delicious chocolate. Apparently, more people like it better because more people take it than any other brand in the entire world. Try x lax yourself and find out how good it is. The Woman Who Tempted Fate It is 1823 in a large manor house in the county of Hartford, England. Lady Anne Grimston is giving a great ball. From miles around, the country gentry have come in their carriages to dance in honor of Lady Anne's 35th birthday. She has never married, some say, because no man is good enough for her. At present, she is waltzing in the arms of her latest suitor, Lord Ainsley. You're more beautiful than ever. Thank you, George. I feel as young as ever. You are young, Anne. I wish your proud spirit could continue forever. I don't want to live to be old. When my time comes, I'd like to go as the flowers go. Your spirit will go on and on. I know it. Mercy, George, you're in a cheerful mood. How lovely you look. Thank you, Grace, darling. I just told George I feel younger than ever. How do you do it, Anne? Oh, I don't know. Perhaps it's because I adore life. Yes, you're just twitting me with the hereafter. (laughs) Yes, that's the trouble with you, George. Why concern yourself with the afterlife? It does not exist. Oh, Anne, I wish you wouldn't say things like that. It's like tempting fate. Then let fate come on. I would welcome a meeting. Ah, here you are. I've come to claim my dance. Oh, that's so. (laughs) I do have the next with you, don't I, Arthur? Yes, and you're not to tell me you wish to sit it out because I shan't let you. (laughs) Very well, then. (laughs) Goodbye, Grace. Thank you, George. And thank you, Anne. May I have the pleasure of the next dance, Miss Gowan? Oh, thank you, Lord Ainsley. Why so pensive? I was worrying about Anne. Anne? Why? Of all people, I would worry about her least. I I wonder if she ever gives much thought to the future. Why should she? Lately, once in a while, I've caught her unawares, and her eyes seem filled with pain. Well, I'm sure it's nothing to be alarmed about. <laughs> I almost wish she were a little less violently healthy. She might need a man around then, and, and I might be fortunate enough to be that man. <laughs> <laughs> Lord, Amy. I wonder why the music stopped so suddenly. That's odd, isn't it? Well, look, the crowd's all rushing over toward the conservatory. Let's go see what's happened. I say, what, what's wrong? Something's happened to Lady Grimston. What has happened? She was with Arthur Kent in the conservatory and suddenly rushed out for water. Lady Grimston had fainted, that's all I know. Let me go to her at once. Oh, Arthur, tell me, is she all right? They're taking her upstairs. I don't know what's wrong. She's still unconscious. Oh, Anne... And I was afraid. I was afraid. Oh, Anne, to see you like this, helpless in your bed. I wish I could be in your place. Nonsense, Grace. Be in my place? A wretched invalid for a month? 
Oh, Ann, darling, can't I do anything? No, no, nothing. It's just a question of time. I never told anyone. But for many years, I've had these heart attacks. Ann, tell me something. Now that, that it's near the end, tell me that you have changed your mind, that you do believe in the afterlife. I wish I could do that, Grace. But I can't. You must believe that you go on and on toward a higher life. I shall never live again. Oh, and don't say it. It is as unlikely that I shall live again as, as that a tree will grow out of my body. Oh, well. Uh, I agree. And take back what you said. Anne. Anne. She... She's gone. She's gone. Strange as it seems, Lady Anne Grimston's last words were that there was as much likelihood of a tree growing from her body as the existence of an afterlife. After her death, a tree did sprout from her grave, bursting her tomb asunder and growing to be the largest in England. Was it merely coincidence? Pulls apart. New York City, 1929, at Times Square, the radio station of the New York Times is a scene of great excitement. Admiral Byrd has reached Antarctica, Little America, near the South Pole. Newspapers carry the headlines over the entire world. The marvels of science and radio have made lightning press dispatches possible. For the first time in history, an explorer has kept directly in touch with the civilized world so that every man and woman travels in spirit to the frozen wastes and desolate seas of one of the coldest places in the world. It is 10 o'clock at night in the radio press dispatch room of the New York Times. The radio operator, R.A. Hilford, is sitting at his radio about to get the nightly code dispatches from Little America. Suddenly, the door opens. Say, Hilferty, where's mine host? Why, he's at home, probably. What's his phone number? Um, Ravenswood 85517. You probably can't get him, though. He's got the receiver off the hook. Always listens to the bird expedition. Button. I gotta get hold. Well, what can I do? I tell you, we gotta reach mine host. Something's gone haywire. We gotta reach him some way. Well, try him on the phone. He may not have the receiver off the okay. hook. Okay. Uh, outside. Outside. Hello. Operator, Ravenswood 85517. Yeah. Oh, this number is Lackawanna 4-1000. Yeah, yeah. What? Well, can't you do something about it? What? Oh, yeah? Same to you. Nine is busy. Yeah, don't bother me now, Palmer. I think this is the bird expedition. Yeah, that's bird's code signal. Say, I gotta reach mine Shut horse. up, will ya? If we don't get him by phone, we're sunk. Nobody can straighten it out but mine hey, horse. Keep quiet. Hilferty. I've got an idea. Yeah. If Meinholz is listening to the Bird South Pole Bulletin, why not radio the Bird Expedition and ask them to send Meinholz a message by code to hang up his phone? Hey, will you shut up? But you've got to do it. All right. But I'll have to cut in on the Bird Press Bulletin. Go on, go on. Write it out. I'll send it anything to keep you quiet. Okay. Uh, interrupt news dispatch and send this message. Meinholz, the Times wants you to hang up your telephone receiver... So it can call you on the phone. Signed, Hilferty. Here it is. Okay, here she goes. The message flashes out of the Times Square transmitter and in the twinkling of an eye has traveled halfway around the world and reaches the radio of the steamship Eleanor Bowling near New Zealand, but still far from the ship of Admiral Byrd in the Antarctic. The Eleanor Bowling sends the message to Admiral Byrd by radio phone. Calling the Byrd Expedition. Calling the Byrd Expedition, number 29, New York. Interrupt news dispatches and send this message. Meinholz, the Times wants you to hang up your telephone receiver so it can call you by phone. Signed, Hilferty. This message reaches Admiral Byrd almost instantaneously. Calling the Byrd expedition. 
Calling the Bird Expedition, number 29, New York. Interrupt news dispatchers and send this message. Mine halts. The Times wants you to hang up your telephone receiver so it can call you by phone. Signed, Hilferty. From the Antarctic, the message is flashed back in code by radio to the New York Times as part of Admiral Byrd's news dispatches. Meanwhile, Meinholz, the cause of all the excitement, sits at home. Ten miles from the New York Times office, also listening to the news dispatches from the South Pole and writing them down. We are... standing... on the... Sea barrier. Oh, uh -huh. here's something important. Mine holes. Say, what the? Hang up. Your telephone. Receiver. Hey, what is this? The Times. Wants to get you. On the phone. <laughs> Sign Hilferty. Well, I'll be darned. <laughs> hello, hello, operator, operator. I want Lackawanna 4 1000. Yeah. Hello. Hello, this is Meinhold speaking. Uh, give me Hilferty. Mm hmm. Hello, Hilferty. Meinholz. Yeah, I just got your message in the bird dispatches from the South Pole. What do you want? Strange as it seems, F. E. Meinholz, manager of the New York Times radio station, was sitting at his home in Bel Air, Queensboro, ten miles from the Times office. He received a message from Manhattan asking him to hang up his receiver. The bird expedition at the South Pole acted the part of Central. The message had traveled 20,000 miles. At the South Pole, as well as everywhere else in the world, occasionally a good laxative is needed. So when the bird expedition went to the South Pole, X-lax went along. The members of the bird expedition chose it for their laxative for the selfsame reasons that it is being recommended now to you. One, it is milder, gentler. Two, with all its mildness, it is thoroughly effective. Three, it is so pleasant to take since it tastes just like delicious chocolate. It seems that no matter where you go, you find x -Lax. England, Canada, Mexico, China, India, South Africa, and even the South Pole. Ask your druggist for a box. Make it your family laxative. It is equally good for young and old. And incidentally, X-Lax is very inexpensive. A box costs only 10 cents at any drugstore. Who is the world's smartest counterfeiter? Who was Mrs. Bloomer? Did Robert Fulton invent the steamboat? Listen to the next Strange As It Seems broadcast for the answers to these amazing questions. You have just heard Strange As It Seems by John Hicks with original music composed and conducted by Felix Mills. Peacocks never lay eggs.